All right, I think that's our cue. Doors closed, party starting. Welcome this morning. Uh, we're talking about how technology impacts the fan experience or just the experience in general, whether it's on the pitch, on, te on TV and broadcast, or just within a stadium. Um, I'm Amanda Windsor-White, I'm your moderator today. I am president of Rugby ATL, Atlanta's professional rugby team. And if you're thinking you didn't know Atlanta had a professional rugby team, you're not in the minority, uh, and you know now. So um, I'd love to introduce our panelists. Starting to my left, we have David Rader. He's the head of US Sports Advisory with Price Waterhouse Cooper. Next, we have Brian Bedford, head of IoT and Verticals with uh, P Chris Cisco, excuse me. Carl Pierberg, SVP and CTO of Strategy and Innovation at AMB Sports and Entertainment. We also have Jeremy Duval, founder and CEO of Seven Factor Software, and Brian Gorney, managing director and enterprise accounts in the United States, pro sports with Verizon. So um, let's give a warm welcome to our panelists. Okay, so we're gonna kick things off with a really easy softball and it'll determine whether how much you like or maybe don't like our panelists so much with the question of who are your favorite sports teams, whether it's college or pro. David, who's your team? Uh, so I'm a UConn graduate, and so I gotta say the UConn Huskies, national champions. Uh, I'm gonna say the University of Oklahoma, all time, modern day, all time winning as college football program in the country, and we're excited to be in the SEC. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll stick with uh, who pays me, and that's the Atlanta Falcons and Atlanta United. Smart. I am contractually obligated to say Georgia Tech because that's where I went for school. Uh, I'm going to play the Homer card, Falcons, Braves, Hawks, and go dogs. Nice. Uh, I will go with the Ohio Bobcats, Miss my alma mater. Woo! Woo, right? All right, so first question, um, Carl, we would love to know, um, how do you see technology enabling fan experiences and or their ability to engage when they're there, right there in uh, Mercedes-Benz Stadium? Yeah, I mean, obviously, technology and the stadium have, have really kind of just blossomed over the last five to you know, 10 to 15 to 20 years, wherever you want to go with I me. Mean, I remember going to Soldier Field in Chicago and, you know, paper ticket and, and cash and, and all that kind of stuff. And now, uh, you know, our stadium uh, can't get into without a digital ticket. Uh, we don't take uh, uh, cash at all. We're a cashless stadium. Uh, and so obviously those kind of, of um, enhancements, changes, wherever have just been kind of a mandatory move that way, but really technology allows us to better understand our fan, better understand how they use our stadium, how they interact with us, allows us to have more uh, inflection points of where we can meet our fan, uh, personalize and customize that experience, but then also remove any of the friction that pops up that keeps you from enjoying the, sta uh, the stadium experience. So, you know, obviously we want to make sure that when you come to Mercedes-Benz Stadium, uh, for an event, be it a Falcons game, United game, uh, SEC championship game, a concert like we have this weekend, whatever it is, that's the event and that's the experience that brought you there. Uh, but I, I've been overly saying, like, you know, that, that there's a collection or a portfolio of experiences that you experience as you attend these events. We want to make sure we can now start to break those down, understand them, and optimize each one of those to make them frictionless, efficient, but also hopefully meaningful and impactful so that you walk away with just a great, under, a great experience and a great time and, frankly, want to come back. So... That's kind of how we're doing it. Yeah, and anyone else, feel free to chime in. Um, go ahead. I was going to say, I think um, with the ubiquitous nature of Internet of Things, that, that has exploded combinatorically because we, you know, if you think back to the Internet, in the old days it was just client-server, and these days everything is connected. We have a supercomputer in our pocket these days compared to what I grew up working on you know, as a kid, uh, as a high school kid. So I think um, that has unleashed a lot of potential and possibilities in the experience arena that just wasn't there thanks to how many devices we have. Now there are some technology challenges we have to solve like fleet management and it's kind of like when we went from like single servers to microservices, you're kind of buying a bunch of problems with that that you have to solve for. But uh, IoT I think has, has drastically shifted uh, the fan experience and provided a lot of opportunity for companies to kind of step in and do some pretty cool stuff. Yeah, I think that that's a great um, transition for Brian and Brian. Um, you know, we know that Verizon and Cisco are both very active brands across the sports and entertainment space. Um, do you see opportunities for tech providers like yourselves to partner together and then deliver new and accelerated outcomes around fan experience? 
Yeah, thanks, Amanda. I'll take the first crack at that. So, uh, yeah, Ver specifically Verizon and Cisco, we've got a very uh, large global partnership, and we've done a lot together in sports and entertainment specifically. Um, we've delivered a number of projects together, and I think that'll, that'll continue uh, into, into the future. I think the space in general, obviously, it's very visible. So it's a great uh, opportunity for tech providers to showcase, storytell, um, and a lot of the capabilities that we have are complementary to one another. So you've got devices and sensors and network and cloud and analytics and security. And you know, across that spectrum, I think a couple of opportunities that we see, one, the way leagues and clubs and venues are distributing content, um, that's continuing to evolve archives, highlights, replay, video, uh, the, you know, that, 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 the way that, uh, that content is processed and, and distributed and, and captured is, is constantly evolving. So there's opportunities across that spectrum. And then the second thing, I think just in general, as another opportunity, data off of the court or field of play, uh, that connects to player health and safety, officiating, uh, you know, X, Y, Z coordinates, again, massive opportunity over that, that spectrum of, uh, of areas that I mentioned earlier. I think anywhere where we as tech providers can collaborate that helps the leagues or the clubs monetize and engage fans is, is really an opportunity. This thing's gonna get some work. It's, this is gonna get a lot of work out here. We need to track this, you know, like player tracking on the mic. Yeah, something, right? There's got to be some analyst. There's got to be somebody smart here that'll figure that out. Um, so, you know, if I, if I think about what we're doing together and then more broadly kind of what Cisco's doing kind of in this space, I've been in this space about 25 years. And when I came to Cisco almost 12 years ago, um, a lot of things were different. Like this iPhone that we all have in our pockets was a little baby. You know, nobody really knew what that was going to do and how it was going to transform this whole, the, really the economy around the mobile device. And um, we've really tried to be centered around thinking about a couple of key areas in this space that I think kind of hit on what Brian said, but also hit on what Carl said is, can we deliver technology and innovation that can um, create uh, operational efficiencies in the building? So that as they operate it, as they think about their day-to-day -day usage of the building, 365 days, what does that look like? How, how do we optimize that? They've got chillers, they've got fans, they've got uh, team operations, they've got concessions, point of sale, they've got um, all of the content experiences that Brian kind of talked about. So how do, we, how do we create a technology platform that allows for that? And then the second thing is if, you know, in this space, just like a lot of businesses, can we use technology as a business platform to generate revenue? And if we can't really do that, then that makes the first one that I talked about probably difficult to execute because we've got to be able to commercially make sense of the technology investment. So as you think about the portfolio that we've implemented in nearly 500 venues around the world now, and, and there's arguably probably nobody that's deployed that this much technology into venues around the world at this stage, um, at least from a core networking perspective, um, it's really with those two kind of premises in mind is how do we create efficiency and operationalize the building? And then how do we ultimately put technology in place? And we've got a number of different examples of that that can drive revenue. And then I think the last piece that I would just touch on is you have to do that in a way that's serviceable. And I think that's really where, you know, our relationship with Verizon comes in is you have to be able to serve that customer. They've got a lot of um, needs that happen. The building ebbs and flows. You talked about the 55 events. I mean, they look very different. When Taylor Swift's there, that's very different than a Falcons game. It's very different than, you know, um, a Georgia Bulldog or an SEC championship game. And so being able to service and manage those, I think, is, is an important one that we all have to be mindful of. Those are great points. And actually, um, you know, a lot of teams and facilities are thinking about, you know, a lot of these could be enormous investments, right, for their organizations. And so the number, well, one of the top questions will certainly be um, monetization. So, David, I'd love to hear your point of view on how, how are these organizations actually going to monetize the network and what's the business case back to sports organizations? Yeah, that's, that's something that we think about every day. Our job at PwC, everybody knows us as an accounting firm, but we also actually, in fact, have a larger advisory practice that works with, uh, in sports with teams and sponsors and leagues to think about how do we monetize these things and how do we 
uh, take what exists today and turn it on for the future in ways that are going to allow for monetization for everyone. Um, and, and the big areas that we're hearing about it from now, a lot of times are coming from sponsors. Uh, you guys, I'm sure, hear this all the time. Uh, but they want to know about the data. They want to know who's in the arena. Um, and not only who are those people and what impressions am I getting, what are, the, what are the basic levels, but how do I combine that with my own data on outcomes? I don't want to know just, you know, Brian went to the game or went to the concert. Uh, cool, you can tell me sort of a little bit about their demographics. I want to be able to connect that and use the, the, um, the Internet of Things and other uh, technologies to connect that to actual purchasing behaviors. Because once you can get to that and they can really start to measure the ROI on these, that explodes the revenue opportunities for them. And it, it makes it so that the, uh, you know, there's an old marketing uh, uh, phrase that's, I know 50% of my marketing dollars are being wasted, I just don't know which 50%. And, and if they can combine that now with the, the network that you guys do, the, the data on who is in the stadium in a privacy compliant way with what are they buying, uh, what are they doing after they leave in the two weeks afterwards, um, we're seeing that as the explosion of, of interest in, in how do I combine those data sets and how do I use that to show here's what's really going on, here's what revenue the Atlanta Falcons are driving for Mercedes-Benz in terms of awareness, in terms of direct uh, activation to, to get there. So we're, we're seeing that. It's reliant completely on, uh, on the infrastructure um, of the teams and the, uh, the technology partners um, and, then, and then combining that in, in privacy compliant ways through clean rooms and other data sharing technology. Um, to get the insights out in terms of what's working, what's not working, and what the actual ROI is for those pieces. I was just gonna, I was gonna add, you, you, you made a mention, and Carl probably can echo this. You, you know, it used to that, you know, when you went to, first of all, there was an analytics department <laughs> in a team, and, um, and if you went to a marketing or a ticketing operation and said, who's in the building, they would say, well, this is who bought the ticket. Yeah. Well, that clearly was not the case in most cases now. But because we have a mobile device now and we, have, we can authenticate on wireless and we have apps that you can download and various SDKs that allow you to consume different information, we're now actually, we now actually know who's there in, in ways that we didn't. And then we can get into some of the personalization things that all the teams are some, doing at some level and, and some, you know, some level of sophistication. So I think that's really important. What we're really seeing as a trend is this move from... Um, uh, kind of street to seat, you know, home to the venue. What does that experience look like? And how then commercially and operationally do we make that work? So whether that's the smart city infrastructure that's going to support it, is that parking, is that um, some sort of sensor technology that allows you, is that queue management as you go into the building, is that what does that experience look like? And then ultimately in the building, the trends that at least we're seeing is how do we engage and do personalization both mobily and then the signage screens, whether it's the video boards and or any of your concourse signage or menu boards or any of that kind of stuff is an amazing amount of inventory. And we've been deploying solutions for, you know, well over a decade now that are allowed, those really are ultimately paying for the technology investment. And so if you have the right kind of, you know, C-level relationship, both commercially and technology, and those decision makers are coming to, to the table together, they're able to look at the things that David kind of mentioned and make an informed business decision that commercially can meet their goals, but then operationally meet their goals. Yeah, I'd love to stick on that trend topic. And Jeremy, what, you know, what sort of trends and patterns are you seeing among clients coming to Seven Factor regarding innovation solutions? Is it more about monetization? Is it more about enhanced consumer experience or creating efficiencies? What's sort of the the common thread? Yeah, so we're kind of in a bit of a wartime economy right now. So we're very much looking more at how do we optimize efficiencies and get more out of our out of our bottom dollar. But really kind of the, the stage is set with this idea of telemetry, which is what everyone's been talking about, right, is we're collecting tons of information. This is something that's been going on for a long time. If you visit the internet, you've been spied upon. Uh, you know, through ad tech and other sort of um, areas where we're collecting information about what websites you're going to. So this isn't a new idea. This is an idea that has just been blown up to now we have 
and just a ton more avenues that we're collecting information like the smart city, the infrastructure, who's in the building, what mobile applications do you have, what's your Wi-Fi Mac, right? We can even see who you are based on the, the unique device in your pocket and when you connect to free Wi-Fi, we probably know who you are. So welcome to the future, unfortunately. Um, but it, it's from what we've seen, it's, it's very much positioned on how do we drive more monetization? How do we get uh, how do we get more out of our technology? Right? How do we do more with less? Which is technology in general, right? In 2023, uh, we figured out the cloud. We've which is just other people's computers. We've figured out um, that APIs aren't really a thing that we care about. We've figured out that it's more about data, right? Every, every, every company that you see that's worth a ridiculous amount of money has something to do with data, right? Because we're collecting information, we're doing trends. Chat GPT, by the way, it's all data. It's just guessing based on what it's been trained on. So by standing up um, unique offerings around this data, what we're seeing is, is clients are able to monetize that. They're able to streamline operations, get people in the door more, provide a better experience. So it really just comes down to collecting information and actioning on it, which sounds simple, but it's actually very difficult to do properly. So I, I do feel like it's important for me to say that we do not track your MAC address when you're at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Um, there are privacy rules that we honestly, and this is something that as a, as a venue operator, yeah, data helps us a lot. Being respectful of that data and earning the right for your data is something that we take very, very seriously. Um, and so we do do a lot of things where we're like, hey, we're going to provide you with an experience. In order to be able to do that, we need this specific piece of information. Yeah. It will be used for this purpose, and then at any time you can get rid of it. I think that's an important thing to do and, and to make sure we acknowledge. Uh, we work with Jeremy uh, very closely on a lot of things, and one of the things that I think is really important is, and we talk about it starting from uh, Verizon and Cisco and talking about our partners, is I like to think of our tech ecosystem in kind of layers, right? You have that foundational communication infrastructure layer that allows everything to talk to each other, and it's, it's become so good to the point that it's, it's taken for granted. But as soon as that isn't connecting and isn't enabling, everything else shuts down. So making sure you have that foundational layer in place is important. We then start talking about that next layer of kind of some of those data systems that come together. Uh, for us at the stadium, you think about things like ticketing or POS systems, business systems, you think about uh, analytic feeds we get in place and everything else. What we then work with Jeremy to do is, how do we start to build a layer now that allows us to look at, at as a composable ecosystem where we can start to pick out the points and the interactions and the spots and begin to marry those together to create those experiences and those flows. Um, you know, it, it, for us, it's as much about abstracting those bottom layers so we don't have to think about them as much. Um, and our, our, our analysts or our, our technologists don't as well. But um, that allows us then to really kind of, again, it, it's cliche, but to think of it as a series of Legos that we can start to put together into awesome experiences is where we do. And working with people like Seven Factor allow us to create that uh, a little bit of additional abstraction that lets our, our developers, our analysts, focus on being developers and analysts and not on you know, waking up in the morning and thinking about writing a, a chat GPT statement that auto deploys an application to, you know, to Azure and, and you know. But uh, uh, you know, it allows us to focus on being good coders, uh, being good developers and focus on, let us focus on the business relationships and the, and the revenue drivers and the channels we're gonna hit on, not on, okay, is my network configured correctly? Is my firewall routes right? Those kind of things. And so that's where like all this partnership all has to work kind of harmoniously uh, to allow people like me to focus on pure business outcomes and not have to like, you know, shit is my, my network up. Sorry, dang, is my network up, right? Like that's where I've got to worry about, so. And, and before everyone panics, yes, your data is anonymized. Sorry. <laughs> well, this next question is pretty much for all of you, but why don't we start with Brian Gorney. Um, let's, let's talk about the power of the network as a service. And so I'm hearing a lot about sports properties and venues, eliminating latency and providing ultra fast experiences. So I'm, I'm not a technological person um, and I'd love to understand what unlocking the power of the network means to you. Yeah, great, great question. Uh, to, from a Verizon perspective, we invested significantly over the past several years in deploying 5G capability into cl close to what is now 100 major uh, sports and entertainment venues uh, across across the country. Se several of those here in Atlanta. Um, so that you know that was a big step for us. It's, it's a it's a great topic, whether it's public or private 5G, whether it's ubiquitous Wi-Fi. The network essentially is enabling a lot of the things that have been mentioned thus far in terms of us as fans engaging in, in the sport, in the game or the event, or uh, helping the club or the, or the team 
run or operate the venue. So a couple things that you know, I would reference, the experiences like frictionless or fa facial authentication or you know, frictionless or cashierless retail, right? Those are running on, on high, high speed secure networks. Um, experiences like you know, you're, at, you're in, the, in the game itself or in the event itself in the stadium and you might take advantage of a second screen experience or some type of AR capability, right? That, that couldn't happen a few years ago um, given the state of networks. And then the last thing I, w I would mention, I think it's safe to say uh, that the, the clubs, the teams, the venues, they want to see fans adopt the use of the team app. And you know, they're continuing to invest in incentives and benefits to, to kind of to, to, um, to draw, that, draw that through loyalty programs, member benefits, um, you know, even content inside the app. So those are a number of things or the types of experiences that I think you know, net, the networks of today or network as a service uh, can power. So I'm gonna go super fast. Um, so I, I started my career working at a company called Danger. We built this little thing called the T-Mobile Sidekick. Does anybody know what that was? Flip phone, big in the 90s. So this thing was on 3G and Edge, right? I don't know if anybody remembers what 3G and Edge was, but back in the day, it was complete hot garbage. Like you could barely download a text message from your dad, right? Um, so I grew up uh, a millennial working in the world where the internet didn't exist and then it turned into all of a sudden we have all this ridiculous bandwidth everywhere. It's incredible to see how networks over literally the last 10 years have just exponentially beaten Moore's law in many ways with how fast they are now. And we couldn't do any of the things we do today if it were not for those innovations, right? And on top of that, think of the software and the infrastructure and the switching and all of the difficulty with managing software-defined uh, software networking, like all of the very difficult problems to be solved in that world have been solved very, very quickly. So more or less, I'm just thankful <laughs> that we have smart people that have worked on that, that allow us to do really cool things, uh, like have second screen experiences, which didn't exist five years ago. Sure, I'll give a quick one. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about the, the networks allow the, the passing on of data, right? That's the most important thing. And you always hear people say things like data is the new oil. Um, and I actually love that expression, but not for the reason everybody says it, meaning, well, because data is so valuable and everybody just wants it. I think of it because uh, data is the new oil in that with if on its own, if it's just sitting there, it's a bunch of potential energy that is worthless. <laughs> um, it can't do anything. It's just a liquid <laughs> that, that doesn't do anything. But then you have to put it into an engine. And those engines are the systems and the, uh, uh, the networks that, that these guys provide um, and, that, and that people like Carl are able to take advantage of um, to create better experiences and all of that. So the data is the key to it. It, it, it is that first layer in, in some ways of thinking about it. Um, but it needs to be put into the proper networks and the proper... Um, uh, engines in order to make it really work. Love that. Um, I, I, I guess I was just, you said something that made me think about it. Um, and when you're talking about network as a service, I, I kind of harken back to, um, I heard a guy talk about just technology and he used this quote that I thought was really interesting. He said, you know, or he said, technology becomes pervasive when you notice it in its absence. So it's like, you know, we all probably checked our phone this morning. Everybody checked your phone this morning? Like, if you didn't, you probably had, like, you'd get twitchy probably if you didn't check your phone, right? Many of you are checking your phone now. Thank you. Um, but, or you had a TV in your house. Thanks, sir. Um, uh, you know, or, or you had, you, you, uh, you turned the radio on or you watched TV, right? And if you didn't have those experiences, you would notice it in its absence, Right. So what we're trying to do is really bring those experiences to where you don't really need to know what's in Carl's closets at the stadium. You just need to know that it works. And so if we do that right, you'll never know. You know we, were, we were at a, an event a couple of weeks ago and somebody, I had a reporter ask us um, about the Super Bowl and Cisco's presence there around security and nobody ever talks about it. That's a good thing. It's the freaking Super Bowl, for God's sakes, okay? <laughs> Guess what? Nobody talked about the Olympics either, and you would have, you'd be scared to death if you knew the amount of hacking trying to go on at the Super Bowl and the Olympics, right? And so 
those are things that we probably need to do a better job of talking about it. But because we don't, because it's not out there, that means we did our job. The, but I just want to kind of go forward one step and kind of hit on something that Brian talked about. Maybe it was in the back before is talking about the trends that we're seeing when it comes to, to running these venues really starts with a high level view of a converged network architecture. So what does that mean, Brian? That seems like a bunch of like technical mumbo jumbo. It's really thinking about all of the services that Carl and his peers are going to be providing. And rather than having a bunch of bespoke systems that don't talk to each other and don't have security and don't have, you know, all of the infrastructure to support them, but can we put a common infrastructure in place? And that you would think, okay, well, why doesn't that exist? I mean, <laughs> Carl's probably laughing. I mean, if you've been in this space a long time, a bunch of siloed systems that don't really talk to each other have are littered throughout really professional sports and, and so forth. And so those systems are, it's important to really think in, in kind of what, what's the art of possible? What do you want that to look like? And, and how do you build that into the, into the model? Yeah, and actually, Carl, if you don't mind weighing in on that, um, how do you architect fan solutions that don't introduce friction and latency when you have, you know, things, uh, platforms that are not necessarily connected? Yeah, I mean, again, it comes back to those, those layers, right? We make sure that our communication layer and our kind of our system layer, they're um, connected and converged and talking to each other. Serves the purpose it needs to serve. Our DAS and our cellular service, which is the same thing, and our Wi-Fi. I all kind of work hand in hand and don't compete and beat for each other so that you can get that base level. Hey, I can do what I need to do there. But then I do think when you start to architect for true, um, for more of that frontline in your face fan solution, that's where you start to look at, hey, how do we start to um, a little bit of have best of breed, a little bit of, of um, connectivity. And it, it's funny, in the last five years, those that system layer, that second layer has all moved from on-prem to cloud-based. Uh, again, using those same kind of, you know, Communication architectures there, and it used to be where when we would invest in a new technology, we'd say, "All right, we're, we're, we're using global payments as our our, our new POS provider. Uh, go integrate with Ticket and go integrate with this and go integrate with that." We're starting to get to a spot now where we can start to kind of handle those integrations because it's more about connecting pipes than it is about um, uh, doing deep seated, you know, decom level integrations. Um, and I think that's where we're kind of getting to this new spot where. Um, you combine things like low code, no code with APIs, with, um, you know, internet of things and, and, and cloud-based compute, and you start to be able to now to allow, allow clubs to build this more customized um, uh, interactions where the clubs are focused on the user experience and what they want their fans to experience, and the vendors that we're integrating with are focused more on providing that connectivity layer and the connectivity functionality because the last thing that frankly a ticket master wants to do with us is say oh you got another person you want to integrate with great super you know that that's not what they're going to do which also means you have to write your apis correctly that's that's a ux that's a ux so again and my undergrad was hci and and so that's a ux thing as well as when you're when you're a technology company you have to make sure that what you're building is usable by external third parties because again, I've done a lot of stuff in my career and I've seen lots of really bad APIs. So let's stick to the integration topic. Um, this question's for David and Brian Gorney. Um, while teams in the NFL and Major League Baseball and NBA and of course Major League Rugby are major brands, many of them operate like mom and pop shops. So how does PwC and Verizon compensate for the differences in operating models and methodologies? And then how are you gonna staff for those projects and how do you learn to speak the same language? Yeah, it's 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 a challenge in many ways. The 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 infrastructure that certain teams have, certain teams that are more technologically forward, like uh, like the Falcons, um, compared to I won't name names, but other other teams that are not not there. You have to understand where they're coming from and how they're building valuation at the team level. Some teams are building it by knowing more about their customers and then selling huge sponsorships, and everybody's trying to sell more tickets, but they're doing it in different ways. And you kind of have to be able to work within the context of what drives valuation for those individual teams. And if it's a, if it's a smaller team that's earlier in sort of their life cycle and then their adoption of, uh, of platforms and technology and systems, uh, you sort of have to work within that. And we, we staff teams to work, uh, internal teams that is, 
uh, to work with them that kind of are aware of these things and we, and we really have those conversations in deep ways about what are your goals um, and how are you looking to drive uh, either revenues or, or valuation improvements and that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, two, two, two things for us. One, uh, we, we effectively have verticalized sports and entertainment inside of Verizon. Um, I think I'm the luckiest guy at Verizon because I get to do this job and lead, lead those teams. Um, so that, that helps us, though, right, because the teams that call on uh, our, our teams who call on clubs and venues and, and the pro leagues, they can, they, they can speak the language to, to a degree. Um, that's one. And then the second thing is from a Verizon perspective, we're – both a product and a services company. So we can offer technology, and that can be Verizon owned and operated or partner or you know, an eco, ecosystem technology. But we also typically uh, in this space will wrap around design, delivery, integration work, and, and potentially ongoing support. So for uh, clubs or teams who may not have certain types of resources, we uh, in, in many cases can bring that uh, to bear. That's great. Well, I am told we are out of time. Um, David, Brian, Carl, Jeremy, Brian, thank you all very much for sharing your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda.